Enthalpy is going to be a new concept we introduce in this lesson, in this chapter on thermochemistry. Now, we've already talked extensively about heat and, and calorimetry and stuff like this, and we're going to see that enthalpy is intimately tied to the concept of heat. All right, so enthalpy here, and specifically we've been looking at the enthalpy change, delta H. So, and it turns out it's related to heat. And it turns out it's not exactly the same thing as heat. So, unless a reaction or process is carried out at constant pressure. And so this is kind of our working definition here. Enthalpy is going to be the same thing as heat for any process or reaction carried out at constant pressure. Now, it turns out there's a more complicated definition for enthalpy that you would study in a more advanced course, but suffice to say, this is as far as we're going to take it. So now one thing you should know is that enthalpy change is an example of what we call a state function, a state function. And a state function is one that just simply depends only on the initial state and the final state of your system. That's all you need to know. And the enthalpy change, as long as you start here and end here, the enthalpy change would be known for sure. So that's an example of a state function. And a better example of a state function that you might be more familiar with would be an example of altitude change. If we look at altitude change, and let's say you were standing right here next to me and I said, hey, come meet me at the top of let's just say Mount Kilimanjaro next week. We both start here, and next week we both end up at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Now, you thought I meant like, let's go hike Mount Kilimanjaro, so you go hike it, and it's a crazy hike, whereas I get on a helicopter and have them drop me off at the top. So, but I meet you at the top there. And so since we both started right here, and then a week from now, we both end up at exactly the same height, exactly the same altitude at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Well, then our altitude change would be exactly the same. Now, we both took two totally different routes to get from right here to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. But because we started at the same place and ended at the same place, that's all we need to know to calculate the altitude change associated with that process. So that would be an example of a state function. So the contrast with that would be one that totally depends on the pathway you take. So another way to define state function, instead of just saying it depends on the initial state and final state of the system, we might also say it is independent of pathway. Doesn't matter what pathway you take, it's gonna be the same either way, as long as you start at the same place and end at the same place. Cool. So it turns out enthalpy change is another example example of one of these state functions. So, and there are a number of these different state functions like volume and temperature. And so, and pretty much just about anything we'll study over the course of chemistry, except for two things. And those two things, we studied them earlier. So Q and W, these are your two big things that are not state functions. So it turns out that even delta E from that first law of thermodynamics, that change in energy or change in internal energy is also a state function. So and let's just say I told you that I had a system and that delta E for this system was 100 joules. And so let's say that that occurred because the initial state of the system we'll call it E initial, was 50 joules, and the final state of the system, E final, was 150 joules. By simply knowing the initial energy and final energy, that would be enough to calculate delta E, 100 joules. Problem is, is it would not be enough to calculate either Q or W, because we could get here, this just means that 100 joules of energy was transferred into the system. Well, that could be 100 joules of heat and no work, or 100 joules of work and no heat, or 50 joules of work, heat and 50 joules of work, or 75 heat and 25 work. It's a lot of different pathways that are possible to get to this net result from this initial state to this final state. And that's why these are not state functions. They totally depend on what pathway you take. But delta E is going to be 100 regardless of whatever one of those pathways you take. And so that's kind of the context here. So you should know that just about anything you could ever see as a state function that we'd study in chemistry, except for Q and W. And as a result, they might give you a question that says, which of the following are state functions or all of the following are state functions, except that kind of thing or which of the following is not a state function. And as long as you know that Q and W are not state functions and everything else pretty much is, you're good to go. Okay, so we've got a couple of new terms to define here. And one is endothermic and the other is exothermic. So 
And if you look, you can kind of even reason out the words here. So endo means inside and then therm deals with heat. And so endothermic means the system is taking heat inside of it. It's gaining the heat. And if it's gaining the heat, then it's going to be gaining enthalpy, it turns out as well. And so we define endothermic as any reaction where delta H is positive. And notice I write greater than zero as a way of representing positive. Whereas exothermic, exo means outside, like an exoskeleton, like bugs or something that have a skeleton on the outside. Exo means outside, so exo heat, so thermo, I'm sorry, outside heat is a system is putting heat outside of itself. It's giving heat off to the surroundings, if you will. And so if heat is leaving the system, so then therefore your heat would be negative and delta G, I'm sorry, delta H here would also be a negative number, i.e. less than zero. So these are a couple of your new terms, endothermic and exothermic, and we're gonna apply them to all of the various phase changes here. All right, so it turns out there are six phase changes and you need to know all six. So with our three standard phases of matter, solid, liquid, gas, you have to know the conversion for all of them. So I can convert a solid to a liquid, a liquid to a gas, or a solid to a gas. And again, solid to a liquid, more, you know, kind of informally, we'd call that melting, and we'll still use that term in chemistry, but formally, we'll refer to this as fusion. So, and it seems kind of backwards. So, and this just means that, uh, you know, uh, many chemists throughout the ages have been sniffing fumes off their own chemicals or something like this, because fusion seems like it should not be what we call melting, but it is. So, and you need to know that. So, you should also know that melting something requires heat. So if I have a piece of chocolate sitting right here, so on the table or something like this, so it's just going to sit there. But if I stick it in my armpit, it's going to melt because in my armpit, it's going to be being supplied with heat from the surroundings. So as a result, then we say that these are endothermic processes. Delta H is positive. They all need heat to happen. Same thing with liquid to gas. That's boiling. But again, we often refer to that as vaporization. We still use the word boiling, but vaporization is kind of the formal term for it here in this case. And then finally, from solid to gas, that is called sublimation. And one you don't come across very often. So, but this is what dry ice does. Dry ice goes straight from solid carbon dioxide to gaseous carbon dioxide. It never passes through the liquid phase, which is why it never feels wet, hence the name dry ice. So, but the process of sublimation also requires heat and delta H is positive. So all three of these processes are endothermic. They all require heat. Delta H is positive. So you have to know that. And, and def, uh, again, you definitely have to know all three of these names. All right, we can also go the other way. We can turn a liquid into a solid, a gas into a liquid, or we can turn a gas directly into a solid. And again, you gotta know all three of these names and you also have to realize that these being the exact reverse of all three of these processes, well then rather than being endothermic, they're going to be exothermic they're all going to give off heat. And this is totally gonna to seem counterintuitive, but as long as you realize that it is the reverse of all these processes, it'll make sense. And so in this case, for a gas turning into liquid, this is condensation. So this is, you know, what happens on the outside of a cold glass of water on a humid day. You get condensation out there. I remember when I was a little kid, I used to think that somehow the water inside the glass was getting onto the outside of the glass. That's not the case, right? You've just got humidity in the air that's experiencing the cold temperatures, the cooler temperatures right at the surface of the glass. And those colder temperatures are leading to the removal of heat. So causing the gas to condense into a liquid. Cool. Now liquid into solid. So we might call this crystallization technically, so which is a very formal term, crystallization, but even in chemistry, we'll probably use the same term you're used to using more commonly, and so I'll put that one on here. So, but technically could call it crystallization as well, but freezing is used pretty, pretty commonly. And then finally, gas to solid is called deposition. And this is one you probably don't experience too often. So, so but this is used in like the, uh, uh, semiconductor industry and stuff like that. So say you want to put a layer of gold on top of a silicon wafer, which is uh, common in certain types of electronics and stuff. So if you want to put a layer, a nice thin layer of gold on there, what you would do is put your silicon wafer in a chamber and you'd set up the temperature and the pressure so that you could actually fill the chamber with gold gas, gold vapor. So, and then you would adjust the pressure and temperature in such a way that that gold vapor 
would deposit a thin layer right on top of that silicon as a solid. And so you'd be going straight from gas to solid. And so we call it deposition. We call the process of, of putting a layer on top, depositing it. And so you want to deposit that in your head. This is one you've probably never seen and the one you're also most likely to forget then. And therefore it's often a really common question on test. If they want to test you on one of these, they love this one because they think you're more likely to get it wrong. And you'll find out that educators, we just love it when you're wrong. Not really. So, but put this in your head. If you want to ask a little bit of a tricky question, this is the one. And it's either called deposition or vapor deposition from gas to solid. Cool. All of these are exothermic. And this is going to seem backwards. You're like, wait a second, Chad. Freezing is exothermic. Yes. Freezing is exothermic. You're like, um, no, Chad. Um, no, I can't make that make sense. Well, you can accept that melting is endothermic and requires heat, then freezing is going to have to give off heat. In fact, that's your freezer's job. Your freezer's job is that when things freeze and give off heat, your freezer's job is to take that heat and pump it from inside the freezer to outside the freezer. Because when things freeze, they're giving off more and more heat and your freezer has to keep pumping it out. So cool. Another example. So if you had a choice of getting a you know, some, some hot water in your face or some steam in your face, which one should you choose? Well, you should choose neither first off, right? So, but you definitely don't want the steam. So think about what happens when steam hits a cold window. When steam hits a cold window, it condenses. Well, the same thing happens when steam hits your cold face. When steam hits your cold face, it condenses into liquid water. And the process of condensation releases a ton of heat right into your face. And steam burns are often worse than hot water burns as a result. Cool. But three more phase changes for you to know, and you definitely need to know that all three of these are exothermic. All right, so we want to conclude this discussion of enthalpy by pairing it up with stoichiometry and figuring out heat changes associated with the chemical reaction here. Now, we looked at chemical reactions earlier, and we saw that there are, you know, mole to mole ratios associated with these and things of a sort, but now we want to relate it to actually the delta H associated with that reaction as well. And so in this case, we got two hydrogen uh, gas molecules plus one oxygen molecule giving two water molecules. This is what happens in rocket fuel or certain types of rocket fuel anyways. And in this case, the delta H is negative 572 kilojoules. So it's negative, it's exothermic, it releases heat. And in this case, negative 572 kilojoules, that's actually really exothermic. This releases a lot of energy, which is why this makes, uh, probably least part of the reason why it makes good rocket fuel. All right. So the question here is, what is the enthalpy change when three moles of O2 are consumed in this reaction? Okay, well, it turns out this is the delta H when one mole of O2 is consumed, and when two moles of H2 are consumed, and when two moles of water are produced. It's scaled to one mole of O2, though. So the question is then, well, what would happen if you consumed three moles. Well, you want to start with what you have, and we start with those three moles. That's what we actually have. Three moles of O2 being consumed. And in this case, the question is, what is the enthalpy change? So what is delta H? Well, in our case, the delta H that we have is negative 572 kilojoules is for one mole of O2, where that one comes right from the coefficient and the balanced reaction. And we'll just multiply these across. This is what it is for one mole. So for three moles, it'd be three times as much. And we'll use our calculator here. And obviously three times 500 is 1500 and three times 72 would be like 216. And we could just add that together, but we'll just confirm the math here. If I'm making a video, I probably should get this right. So negative 1716. Kilojoules. And there's the answer to the first question. We've got two more to go. We're still going to do two more questions involving this reaction. The next one says, what is the enthalpy change when five moles of H2 are consumed? And so in this case, again, my delta H is still negative 572 kilojoules, but that's not per one mole of H2. That's per two moles of H2, according to the balanced reaction. So that's per two moles of H2. And so we'll multiply this across, the moles cancel, and we'll get 5 times negative 572 over 2. So 5 times negative 572 divided by 2 is negative 1430. All right, last question and the hardest of the three. What is the enthalpy change when 9 grams of liquid water 
are produced. And so in this case, we can see that this is the delta H, negative 572 kilojoules, for two moles of water being produced, but we want to know what it is for nine grams of water being produced. Well, we saw earlier that even if it's not the same number of moles of either oxygen or hydrogen that are being consumed in the reaction, I can relate it to the number of moles you know, that we're being asked about because it's moles. But if I'm in grams, well, then the first thing I gotta do is convert it to moles because I can relate this negative 572 kilojoules to two moles of water, then this better be in moles. So that'll be our first step. That's why this makes this one the hardest, one extra conversion. And so one mole of water weighs 18 grams. Formula weight right off the periodic table. All right, so that'll be moles of water now. And in this case, then we take our negative 572 kilojoules is for two moles of water being produced. And voila, so nine divided by 18 is a half and a half of negative 572 is 286. And so in this case, negative 286 kilojoules. Cool. And that is how we relate enthalpy and stoichiometry. And again, the big key is just start off with whatever you're being asked and how much you have or of a reactant or how much of a product you're trying to produce. And then use the delta H provided scaled to your reactant or product and the number of moles in the balanced reaction. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like and a share, one of the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you're looking for practice problems on enthalpy or stoichiometry, and if you're looking for the study guide that went with this lesson, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.